introduce Ms. Tiffany Gunter, Regional Transit Authority of Southeast Michigan, uh, the CEO and Chief Operating Officer. <coughs> Excuse me, Deputy CEO. I just I just promoted you. Thank you, but I do have a boss. Good I didn't last evening. Long. <laughs> Good evening, all. And thank you for this opportunity to come and talk about the Regional Transit Authority and the transit master plan that we have developed for the four county region. Um, in talking to uh, Mr. Kittle, I learned that you know there's not a lot of information out there about what the RTA is. So the way in which I've kind of just defined the presentation is we'll talk a little bit about the authority itself and what it's charged with doing. We'll talk about the problem that we're actually trying to solve the plan that's been developed to attempt to address those issues in this region, and then we'll <coughs> talk about the benefits we believe that they bring into the region. So with that, the RTA itself um, is an organization that was developed or created legislatively in December of 2012, and it was created with the purpose of coordinating the existing public transit system, so SMART, DDOT, in Detroit, AAATA, Ann Arbor's Transportation Authority, and the People Mover. And so it's essentially becoming the umbrella organization for all of those individual transit providers and so that we can start to coordinate a little bit better and gain some efficiencies with the services that are provided today. The second charge of the RTA was to secure a long-term dedicated funding source. And this is key um, for the purpose that, you know, we send a lot of dollars to the federal government and every other major metropolitan area is enjoying the benefits of major premium transit options and being built in their communities. And we aren't able to do that because we haven't shown a long-term dedicated funding commitment to operate that infrastructure or that investment that's made. And so the RTA was tasked with doing those two things. So we've been busy at work. And one of the things that I hear a lot when I go out is, well, you know, I've heard there's been 26 failed attempts at regional transit over the last five decades. And it's true, there have been that many attempts. So why are you any different? What gives you the belief that you can make it happen this time? And there's a couple of things about the way in which the enabling legislation was designed to try to overcome those obstacles that we've seen in the past. Number one is the governance structure. We have representation from each, each of our member jurisdictions. We have a 10-member board <coughs> that's comprised of two representatives from each of the counties, Macomb, Oakland, and Wayne, members are appointed by the county executives, there's two each. Washtenaw County appoints two members from their chair of the Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners, and then there's one seat for the city of Detroit that's appointed by the mayor. There's a non-voting representative who serves as chair and is appointed by the governor, that's Paul Hilligans. And so we have a group that gets together every month, all 10 of them, and we have very pleasant conversations about how to trade off, you know, money between, I'm kidding. They are not pleasant <laughs> conversations at all. They're, they're difficult conversations about how you split funds between the providers that are limited in, in nature. And so we've, we're still standing and I'm happy to report that we are still having those difficult conversations and overcoming those challenging conversations um, on a very regular basis. And uh, with that, we also have, that's our governance structure. We also have a planning function. So governance is one, planning is second. And there's a lot of plans. I'm not sure how much you all are involved with SimCog, but you know, we're good in this region at making plans. And what you've seen up until now have been illustrative plans. Very good plans. I was involved with some of them. But there's no fiscal constraint on these plans. And so the RTA didn't have that luxury knowing that we would be asking the public to fund the implementation and operation of this system. We had to get very clear and very solid on a conservative financial model that we believed was viable, politically feasible, financially viable. And that's what we, be we believe we've, um, we've developed. One of the critical pieces of this plan is that we are subject to what's called an 85% return on investment provision. Is anybody familiar with that provision? So that provision basically says whatever a member jurisdiction raises at the county level must be returned back to that member jurisdiction in the form of public transit capital dollars or operating dollars. So we're answering kind of that age-old question of what's in it for me and making sure that each county gets back what they put into the system. So that's part two. And that, you know, is no simple feat. We put together a financial task force comprised of members from the banking industry, municipal finance backgrounds, and brought them together to have them scrub every single assumption that we put into our financial model that spans a 20-year pr um, program. And what we came out with, with a, was a plan that we believe, honestly, is a feasible, viable plan. 
The third thing is the funding mechanism. For the first time in the four county region, we have the opportunity to place the question of funding on the ballot and we will be on the ballot on November 8th um, with the question of a 1.2 property tax millage to fund the implementation and operation of this system. So what are we trying to solve with all of this? That's a whole lot of bureaucracy and governance that I just talked about there. What, what does that get us? Well, when we looked at what was the problem that we're actually trying to solve, we found that today for all of the transit options that are out there, we invest about $69 per capita to provide those services, and that's operating. And so we said, well, what does that mean nationally? How do we compare? How do we stack up? So we looked at Boston. We looked at Seattle. We looked at Denver, Minneapolis, Chicago. Um, uh, Seattle. We looked at all those places and said, well, what do they put in? Apples to apples. And we found that on the bottom scale, they put in about $140 per capita. At the top of that scale, they put in about $471 per capita. Now, I was raised um, uh, in a modest home with a very uh, frugal mom who would pop me in my head if I said, well, they spend more, so we too should spend more here. So we said, well, what do we get for what we invest? Are we simply just more efficient with our resources? Let's unpack that. And what we learned was that today, 92% of the people in this region cannot get to work in under an hour using the options that are available to them. That's a pretty decent amount of people. That's 92% of our region. And we also found that of the systems that operate today, most of them end their services at 10 o'clock in the evening. So when you have people that work in the mall in their last shift, and I was one of them when I was much younger, um, sometimes you find out uh, in, a, in a rude awakening sense that at 9 o'clock your job is not over. You have to fold clothes, you have to count money, you've got to take out garbage, and you need to have a reliable option to get you home once you're finished with that job at 10 o'clock at night, not 9 o'clock at night, and mall hours continue to expand as we, our appetite for consumerism grows, you know? And so we wanted to make sure that we're looking at a way in which we can span the service hours so that they serve not just a 9 to 5 commuter, but everyone. What we also found was that sometimes our seniors and our people, people with disabilities, our most precious populations, can be left at the border of 8 Mile when trying to get to the DMC or to the VA to <coughs> simply get picked up by another service provider to get to a doctor's appointment. And that's after they've made an advanced reservation of 24 hours. And, you know, one time is one time too many with your most precious population. And so when we looked at all these things that are happening in our region, we said perhaps perhaps $69 per capita is not sufficient to get the type of system that we want to see for Southeast Michigan. And then we did an analysis of our travel patterns. And what we found was quite curious. You know, we got 67% of Detroiters leave Detroit and go to the suburbs every day to go to work. And conversely, we've got 72% of suburbanites leaving their suburbs either cross in between counties or go into the city of Detroit every day. And we said, well, let's take a look at that and unpack that a little bit further. When we did the analysis of who's working in downtown Detroit, Midtown, and New Center, we found that 73% of the jobs are held by people who live in the suburbs. So that's a lot of people making that commute every day. And that commute, I will tell you, I just did the reverse of it, is grueling. Um, and so I make that commute. You I'm make that you. commute. I'm yes, sir. <laughs> so, that's right. And so we wanted to see if we could wait, if there was a way to work this system to make that commute something that's a viable option via public transportation. And so with that, I'll get into the plan, and we'll talk about the plan a little bit and what this plan provides. This comes up a tad sketchy, but what this shows you is one probably one of the most misleading maps I've ever produced. And that shows each corridor has transit on it, those, those gray corridors, your major corridors, your major high population and employment density corridors. But in the city of Detroit, you've got that border at 8 Mile that basically cuts off the Det Detroit Department of Transportation and then again at Telegraph. And then the SMART system picks up in Macomb, Oakland, and Western Wayne counties. Mm -hmm. And then far to the west, you have the Ann Arbor Area Transportation Authority operating in Washtenaw County. And so these systems don't coordinate. By and large, they work in their own independent jurisdictions and every once in a while cross uh, county borders. We've built our plan in what we call building blocks. So they're different layers, and we kind of talk about this as a family of services. The local bus, fixed route local bus, is absolutely essential to a good, robust transportation network. But it's not, the, it's not where you stop. That local bus connects up communities and gets people into a larger system that gets them the distances that they want to go. Bus rapid transit is the first building block in our plan. And we've proposed services on Woodward between downtown Detroit and Pontiac, on Gratiot between Mount Clemens and Detroit, 
along uh, in Michigan Avenue with the service to the airport and in another segment between Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor in Washtenaw County. Bus rapid transit is really what we affectionately refer to as light rail on wheels. It has all of those amenities and we've done nearly 200 public meetings now and every time we talk to people about this and we ask them, what do you want in a rapid transit system? They tell us that they like the dedicated lanes so that it doesn't have to interact with mixed traffic because it slows this vehicle down. They like the fact that you know there's this signal preemption, there's technology that can allow the vehicle to move faster. It doesn't have to stop because it can tell the signal to turn green. They like the well-appointed stations with the ticket vending machine so they don't have to fumble with a fare box. They like the real-time information displays that tell you when your vehicle's arriving. They like the frequency. BRT systems typically run 20 hours a day and every 10 minutes or every 15 minutes in the rush hour and the non-rush hour so you don't have to rely on a schedule. So they tell us about all these amenities that they like. They like the fact that the vehicles have the side open doors where you can just walk on, roll on, if you're on crutches, hop onto a vehicle so it's convenient to use it, it's easily accessible. So you can get that with BRT and you can get close to 60 miles or a little over 60 miles worth of BRT for the cost of 10 miles of light rail. So we believe that this is the best cost efficiency model for an area that is still building its appetite for public transportation. Why do you, can I ask Tiffany? I, I'm sorry, I'll try a question. Why do you call it light rail? Are you just likening it to a rail? Position? Likening it to, ooh, I went back too far. Likening it to a rail, but it is bus vehicles. It does not have any rail infrastructure underneath it. It's it, light rail on wheels. But it seems like the biggest obstacle there. The advantage of light, real light rail is you don't get affected by construction, which yes. is a huge in this area, and you don't stop. That you know every intersection, so you never get quite. I mean, I, I make that trip a lot mm -hmm. on Woodward just to get off 75, and it's still an hour to downtown Detroit if you're going to go in, even if you get dedicated lanes. Even with the dedicated lanes, but the beauty of the BRT with that signal preemption technology that's mm -hmm. available is that even for the individual who says I'll never use the BRT lines, if they stay with the transit vehicle. The signal timing is such that they don't have to stop. That's a free flow model that gets you pretty much from Pontiac to downtown Detroit with very minimal stopping. Do you have a bogey for some of these? I may be taking some of your thunder for later of, of travel times that you'll talk to us about later, what you think you'll see on some of the major mm -hmm. endpoints? Right. I do have travel time data. I don't have it with me right now, so okay. I can ask Marie to kind of look that up for me on okay. our website while I'm away. talking. It's on our website, Marie. You can find it. Just go to the bus rapid transit, the Woodward page. Thank you so much. Um, and so, yeah, the travel times are very competitive with the automobile is what I can say. And we've seen um, some in a lot of instances they beat automobile traffic because of the dedicated nature of, the, of those lanes. Okay. The next layer of the plan is regional rail. Regional rail is a project that I actually cut my teeth on back in 2004 when I moved to the public sector and I began working at SimCog. And this is something we've talked about for a very long time in this region. The state of Michigan purchased several years ago the segment going between Kalamazoo and Dearborn. And when they did that, they did it with the intention of building up this, lane, lane, this uh, rail line so that it can have capacity for high-speed rail. And so they've made all these infrastructure investments and they've built capacity on the line. And so the RTA has had the opportunity to kind of benefit from all of the work that the state has done and we can do this regional rail project at a fairly low cost um, when you look at regional rail projects throughout the, throughout the nation. We have five stops in Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti, the city of Wayne, Dearborn, and the new center station in the city of Detroit. It would operate with eight round trips per day, um, connecting up major jobs and major employment centers between Ann Arbor, Dearborn, and the city of Detroit. So I added this slide, it's a new one, just for this presentation this evening because sometimes I talk about these and you really don't see how they work together until you see one major rapid transit system map. And this sort of shows you the stops and the way in which the system would operate throughout the region as a rapid transit network. But at the RTA we said this isn't enough. This isn't enough to solve the problem of disconnectedness and the connectivity issues that we're trying to solve. So what's next? Um, those are just some of the features. Oh, I did not realize that I am not that loud. Is this better? Yeah, it's okay. it's fine. You were fine You're first. good. You'll I was fine. fine. Okay, okay, I'll keep going the way I was. Um, this just gives you some of the features of the rapid transit system service, the hours that it would operate and the service times. Is that pickup times that you're showing? 10 and 15 minutes? Is that meant to be? Every 10 and 15 minutes a vehicle would arrive. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Every 10 minutes in the rush hours, every 15 minutes in the off-peak hours. 
So the next layer of the plan is what we call cross-county connectors. And the <coughs> cross-county connectors really start to speak to that issue of being dropped off at city limits and not being able to get a one-seat ride. <coughs> There's 10 of these um, routes, and they function simply like this. Grand River today has the Detroit Department of Transportation operating from downtown Detroit to 8 Mile every 10 minutes in the rush hour and every 15 in the non-rush. That's the gold standard. When you pick up at 8 Mile out to just before Wixom, smart service operates at every half an hour in the rush hour and every 60 minutes in the non-rush. So at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, if you get dropped off at 8 Mile and Grand River and you see the taillights of a smart bus, you've got an hour before another one arrives. And that doesn't make any sense. We said it makes sense to optimize corridors. And that's what the role of the RTA is at its core, is to make the system work and to make it more effective and more efficient. So we work with the providers. We've divided these lines, five and five each, and we said from downtown Detroit to Wixom, we'll have one provider providing that service. But since you're the foundation, the RTA will pay the incremental increase in cost to provide that service. So we don't take on the full burden of the cost. We maximize the existing investment, and we allow that to be a one-seat ride from downtown Detroit to Wixom, 18 hours a day at the 10-minute or 15-minute frequencies. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's what we've done on all of these routes. So you look at 12 and 15, obviously that's just smart that operates those routes. But it, the same philosophy it applies, and that is we pay the incremental increase in cost to improve the frequencies and expand the span of service. The last feature of the cross-county connectors, and I don't want to lose that, is that there's a per mile investment um, that improves the attractiveness of public transportation. What we've heard a lot from uh, uh, everyone that we talk to is the pole in the road and the side of the road is just simply not attractive enough for people to, that have a choice to choose to use public transportation. So putting in stations that have some of those real-time information features in those, uh, on those routes is also a part of this plan. The next layer of the plan is what we call commuter express. The commuter express lines are really trying to connect up services in areas that typically don't have any public transportation options today. So you'll see along I-75 from Great Lakes Crossing to downtown Detroit, we have a point-to-point -point system that works for commuters and it essentially operates this way. You have a park and ride lot along these routes, you stop in the major job centers, you pick people up, you get them to work in the morning and in the evening. And so we're proposing that also along M59 between Mount Clemens and Pontiac with a stop in Troy at the Somerset Mall. And then on Plymouth Road and Canton Road between Western Wayne and Washtenaw counties to create a linkage between those historically kind of disconnected areas as well. Before I move on from that, there's one point I'd like to make <coughs> about the I-75 because I realize we're a little bit outside of I-75 at the Great Lakes Crossing, and I know that there were some current concerns that we didn't come for, for far enough north. And uh, some of that is the population and employment density argument that we couldn't, we couldn't justify the demand to have an everyday service going that way, but that is an operational detail that I just wanted to highlight to say, if you have, like you said, at the DTE Energy Music Theater, a major event, there are operational details that could say, we can get you the full distance to that location. But those are things that you do sort of on an ad hoc demand basis as well, instead of doing it every single day when there might not be so much demand. So it seems a little, mm -hmm. I have to ask, it seems a little odd, and, I, and, and maybe the, the devil's in the details of the analysis, but when I, when I think of this area, and I, I've worked in downtown Detroit at the Rensen, right, so that's the long okay. commute. I now work at the Warren Tech Center for GM. So we've got 30,000 of my fellow folks working down there that a lot of folks move up in this area, right? From Milford, Lake Morian, Clarkston. I mean, that's a, you, you don't need to you just look out at I-75 in the morning and see the traffic flow going down. And during the height of the recession, when unemployment was 30% in Detroit, the commute was easy, scarily easy, right? Now it's, it's, it's dense, which is a good thing. People are employed. But there's a huge volume of people that come out of this northwest corridor down there and the attraction of driving to Pontiac to pick up the, the Woodward the isn't there, and picking up at Great Lakes isn't there as well. But there's a huge opportunity to get density off the road so everything else can move faster if there's more access up here to a, a, a speedy route. I'm surprised that the demand wasn't seen as higher mm -hmm. just because observationally, if you look at southbound 75 in the morning, anywhere between 6 and 8 o'clock, other than the construction, it's a parking lot, whereas northbound is, is completely, if you work north of here, you're great. But I'm really surprised, particularly along that corridor, 
moving down through the Warren area and through through Troy all the way to Detroit because I'm just so many of my comrades come from this area. And if there was a better opportunity where you could put your feet up and take it easy on the way in, Absolutely. we'd take it. So and there's the thing, you know, you got your technical analysis and then you've got human beings that experience it every day real time, right? And so that's one of the things that we love about the RTA plan is that it is alive and then when we get this type of feedback and we know that there's a demand, we can absolutely make adaptations to this plan. And at the, towards the end of the presentation, we'll talk about the flexible <coughs> transit options that are available that can absolutely hook you in to these corridor programs or perhaps even justify the need to extend these, these routes a little bit further than they are now just to pick up additional demand. We do identify as part of the planning process sort of a five mile to 10 mile capture area for drivers. Mm -hmm. And we believe that we caught the, a large portion of those drivers at, with the park and ride opportunities that are at Great Lakes Crossing. So we would have to work with you a little bit more closely to understand where those opportunities exist within the smaller areas of the community. But absolutely, we're open. It's not something, this plan is not a closed plan. It's something that's a, adapting on we'd a regular be, basis. We'd be willing to do that. And just as an example, we're 30,000 residents, mm -hmm. largely bedroom community. We have a nice, vibrant business, but it's by far minority. And most people in, in independence leave the township to work, and mm -hmm. a lot of them go in that direction. So I, I think it'd be great to work with you on what really, you know, not just that where you'd have to go to, but how it need to be to be successful. You know, going down to Pontiac, and I, by the way, worked for 10 years right next to that transit mm -hmm. authority. That's not a great uh, um, Dynamically, it's not great to drop off there, and Great Lakes uh, Crossing is a little better, right? There's all kinds of other stuff there, but appreciate I it. I think, I think we could provide some insight into a practical application that maybe not be coming through just with trip counts. Absolutely. I welcome that conversation, so let's do that for sure. Um, the next layer of the plan is what we're calling local service. So, um, you know, the SMART bus organization has articles of incorporation that allow for opt-out communities um, and many of them in this area are opt-out communities. The RTA, however, while SMART will maintain its articles of incorporation and the opt-out is still of allowed in the SMART system, the RTA enabling, enabling legislation does not have a current opt-out provision. So we're all in together or we're all out together as a four-county region. And so what we said was, it's not, you know, it makes sense that we start to push into some communities that have major employment centers and create some linkages into the regional network because they will be paying into the system. We want to try to provide something for everyone. So in your historic, you know, your typical kind of the poster child, Livonia, Northville, um, Rochester Hills, are, as opt-out communities, you'll see lines going in those, into those communities to reach major employment centers with services that operate about every 60 minutes or so into the, into the, and pull into the regional network or from the regional network. The next layer of the plan we call Airport Express. We heard from every community uh, in, in our public meetings that they wanted a viable option from their county into the airport where they could park their cars in a safe place, get to the airport, not have to pay airport parking fees, and not have to pay 75 or $100 to simply get a trip to the airport. So when our CEO, Michael Ford, was in Ann Arbor Area Transportation Authority, he introduced what was called Air Ride. And Air Ride is an over-the-road coach. It travels along I-94 from Ann Arbor into the airport. It's synced to the, air, the flight schedules. And it has really had overwhelming success right now at about a 67% fare box recovery ratio. And that's higher than what you see in New York, where people, by and large, have bought into the public transportation system. So we sought to mimic that in every other area since it's been so successful. So along I-275, um, I coming from the 12 Oaks Mall, along M39 from the Troy Transit Center, and from the Lakeside Mall in Macomb County, and from downtown Detroit to the airport as well. So we've got a lot of service going to the airport, which is something that the public has told us that they absolutely think is critical for the RTA to produce. I have a question about that. Yes, ma'am. Do you have your um, time estimates on that? How long you is know, it going to take? You know, those are, it would be the same as your drive time because they're not in segregated lanes. They're in their own, they're in, the, they're in mixed traffic. So whatever it would typically take you to drive those routes would well, be so we'd have to drive to Troy yeah, and wait us. for the train and mm -hmm. then get on the thing, yeah. which is... Ours would be a lot longer. You'd be adding a lot of time. It would be adding some. But, but you'd get out of the park. That would, the, the parking and not having to go there being dropped at the gate. But for us, it'd be, I mean, it takes me an hour to get to the airport. It'd take probably yeah. Yeah, an hour straight down twice that to get to, if I yeah, tried it'll to do it. Yeah. It'll, it'll yeah. take a lot longer. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> the last uh, line on the map that you can see is the streetcar. And I think that... Um, 
everyone's heard sort of about M1 Rail, the Q line, the 3.3 mile catalyst project that serves downtown Detroit, Midtown, and New Center area. Um, I'd like to talk about this because sometimes I find that there's some animosity towards M1 Rail in some groups, um, maybe not this group, and that's very good to hear, but just so I, I'm, I, I communicate well with you on this is that the, uh, the M1 Rail has to operate independently as a private entity for 10 years before the RTA can pick up its operations. And when we do pick up the operations, which is scheduled for 2027, it accounts for about 1.8% of the entire plan. Cost? The cost, 1.8%. The operational cost in the 2027 operation. will be 10% estimated of your total budget. 1.8. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1.8, that's what I'm Of sorry. the total budget that goes all the way for the full 20 year program. Mm -hmm. And with that, we don't back out in that 1.8% calculation, the $60 million in matched match funding that makes us more competitive at the federal level that allows us to build out the remainder of the rapid transit network through BRT. So I just want to kind of level set with that one and let people know that M1 is the catalyst project for that actually created the RTA and for that um, we there's no way we could have built a hundred and thirty million dollar rail line that went three miles and met yeah. our requirements of the law to do the 85 percent return on investment. Is that net cost after revenues received from ridership? Is that the, what you just referred to as a portion of your budget? Is that after deducting off revenue, it's still a, a loss of that much? We annually? did not. We did not account for the ridership and okay. the fare box. So there's some offset there. There's you know, some offset there. Excepting well. if you look at the fare box type of approach at 65, there's it's probably a cost. Right? It's not going to be a profitable venture, but mm -hmm. it's not as bad as, as you're putting out there. <laughs> I got to be honest with you. I, mm -hmm. I worked on there. Mm -hmm. I think it's fantastic, and most people wouldn't wouldn't say that. Mm -hmm. I think it's wonderfully executed. It's horribly too short. It's horribly it, too it, short. It's, it's <laughs> pathetically sub-optimized for that. For 1.2%, I'd rather, I think as an RTA, if I was in your shoes, I'd rather pay 8% and have mm -hmm. that thing go up to past 8 mile and, and have it really useful. It is a downtown, having fun up to midtown, you know, conveyor of people. Mm -hmm. It'll do that job, but hor horribly short-sighted not to, to get that thing planned to, to go out farther, I think. I, I love the way it's laid out. Most of the people in Detroit do, and they're looking forward to it. Fantastic. But it needs to be longer. We, we, we looked at several alternatives. When we looked at the Woodward BRT, what our hope is and our goal is is that because it comes all the way to downtown Detroit and it has those amenities and those features that are very attractive to a choice rider, we do believe that that will serve its purpose as the long the, the long haul uh, rapid transit option, because when we looked at the cost, that three miles was $135 million to build, and it's just very cost prohibitive for us to try to build it any further um, along Woodward than it is today. Put it in the most expensive part, bridges, and I mean, it was, that was the most expensive place to put it. But I'll, I'll yeah, to share with the board, the my company's hiring new people, and they want to live downtown, and they're all excited about it. It's the first time you've heard that in a long time, but the younger people that we're hiring are really into the downtown urban area, and they're, they're exactly. really looking for. I think it's going to be great for the city, but it's just not going to be a real transportation lift. It's more of a fun while you're down there thing. <laughs> fun while. <laughs> oh, let me go back one. And then the next layer of the plan is the plan that you cannot map. And that is the services for seniors, people with disabilities, or individuals that need job access reverse commute um, funds to, pr to have public transportation options. And you may have heard some back and forth in the media, I'm not sure, that um, in the county executive's office, we are in continuous conversations with them to determine the right level of investment for this fund. What we have to do, and I'll go back here, is 20, uh, Every single route that's on this map is federal, where we're federally required to provide ADA. what's called ADA, paratransit complementary service within three quarters <coughs> of a mile of each of those routes. What we've identified is uh, that if we tie the paratransit flexible transit funding to the over 65 population, it's the fastest growing population in this region, it's the, it's the biggest investment we're going to make. It's about a 33% increase over what's being done today and in, throughout the nation we can't find a larger investment being made. So that paratransit federal requirement takes about 25% of that pot. It's a $307 million pot. And for the other 75% of that, we are identifying what can we do in the northern and western Oakland communities, in the rural Washtenaw communities, western Wayne where you don't see lines on the map, and northern Macomb. Because everybody does participate in this plan and it's only fair that these communities are able to get a benefit out of it. So what we've developed in working with Oakland, the Oakland County Executive's Office, and like I said, it's still in conversation, is called flexible transit. 
And flexible transit basically says these communities know what their needs are. They know where their job access reverse commute individuals are, they know where their seniors are, they know where people with disabilities are, and they can tell RTA better what their needs are and develop applications to go in for a grant program that RTA can then do the grant making, provide the vehicles and whatever operational needs is part of that grant so that you can hopefully, working in consortium with your neighbors, can develop those, uh, those systems that can either take you in between your communities or into the regional transit network. And so that, like I said, is still a, a conversation in progress. Uh, we have increased the fund right now from 79 million to 144 million for northern and western Oakland County communities. And we did that by taking money from the BRT infrastructure and reducing some of the service levels on other routes in the southeast Oakland area. And what the county executive's office has made clear to us is they want to see an equitable distribution of funds in both southeast and northwest Oakland County. And so we're still working towards the goals that will satisfy. And as part of that, that's why I'm here tonight, to kind of hear about those uh, desires and what those, those, those needs are so that we can continue those conversations and get the right, um, right amount put back into the system that satisfies the uh, transportation demands that you have. So I'll close with, after all we do all this, you know, making the system simple. I'm a transit rider from time to time. I also drive my car, so I'm <coughs> kind of in that weird choice rider space. And uh, one of the things that frustrates me the most is that every single bus system that you get on, you got to get a different fare card for it. It just doesn't make any sense. It's one region we should have a coordinated fare system. So we've done the work to um, determine that each of the providers has a magnetic stripe card that can be compatible with the other one. So if we in implement this, we'd be about at the level, I think it would bring us about to 19th century, right? So we say well, there's a little bit more work you have to do beyond just getting a magnetic stripe card. And so like the Orca card in um, Seattle and the Venture card in Chicago where you can use your smartphone, debit card, credit card, any fair medium including cash to simply get on the vehicle without having to jump through hoops to figure out how to use the system or find a kiosk is exactly the system that we need to move toward and we've made provision in our financial model to get to an open fare system within the first couple of years of this plan. So with that, um, a couple of points, a couple of takeaways. Um, the RTA has looked at that existing um, $69 per capita investment. What would this plan do? It would take us to $157 per capita, putting us on par with some of our peer regions to attract talent and jobs to this region. It will um, also, we had the state of Michigan run an independent economic analysis that showed that it would support 67,800 jobs over 20 years, which is about 3,000 jobs a year from direct RTA spending. That doesn't include any of your transit-oriented development. And it also showed that it would increase our gross regional product by $6 billion and our personal income growth by $4.4 billion. So there's a real economic argument to be made, as I said before, that does not include the economic development that's attracted to the area as a result. That's just direct RTA spending. Um, the plan itself, people ask us often, what's the implementation timeline? For every line on the map, except for your major premium transit options, they're implemented and operational within the first five years. The Flex Transit program starts virtually immediately in 2017 as the dollars are collected, they go back out. And the rest of the plan, the premium transit options, are built within the first 10 years. So we're op fully operational by 2027. Um, there's a couple other facts, but I want to save time for you all to be able to ask some questions, so I'll stop talking. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Tiffany. Great job. I have a couple. You had made reference to the federal funds, you know, that are generated by some of the different municipal local units of government to help. Are, are there federal dollars coming in to support RTA as well? Right today. Will there, will there be? Will there be? Yes. Our plan identifies about $693 million in federal funding that would be attracted to the region that would help us to build the rapid transit infrastructure. And with that, about four, a little over $400 million in state funding to be able to do the same in terms of building out that infrastructure. The RTA, in terms of the, the state and federal dollars that come in, we've taken a major forbearance. Our enabling legislation, because we recognize some of the smaller transit providers throughout the region also get those state funds, we're not able to draw down those funds or compete with those other providers for the rapid transit options. That would essentially crush the rest of the state operators, and we don't want to see that happen, and our legislators did not want to see that happen. So we don't take those funds. What we'd be looking at are special grant funding funds for major infrastructure investment. You yeah, talked about the RTA becoming the umbrella organization that would envelop the Ann Arbor Transit, Detroit Transit, Smart 
Now, will that be, there will only be one administrative function with one union, or they're still going to be, are these still separate operating entities? They will still be separate operating entities. The RTA, our job is to try to be a lean, mean operating machine, so we wouldn't have a large administrative function. Our administrative budget in the entire plan is about 2.4 percent of the entire budget, um, recognizing that people don't want to pay for operations. They don't want to pay for us to walk around and look at each other all day, right? And so the individual entities would still exist as they are today. And we would genuinely make an effort to work towards um, economies of scale and consolidating where we could with the hope that in the future there will be enough trust throughout the region that we could work towards a consolidation model versus a partnership model. Autonomous vehicles, I didn't hear that anywhere in your presentation, and that seems to be the new direction all the automobiles are going right now. Mm -hmm. How does that fit in with RTA? So that fits in well. So one of the things that we talk about when it comes to autonomous vehicles is, one, um, it's, it's early in the process. Like even the things like insurance haven't been figured out, like does the auto owner, auto company still hold it or does the individual hold it? How, does all, how do all of these things work? But like I said before, the plan is living and breathing and adaptable. And so what we see, those options are uh, last mile, first and last, three mile, five mile to get people from either their homes or a particular location to the regional transit network. And so autonomous vehicle infrastructure is something that we would love to participate in. And the federal government, there's a federal working group that is looking at ways in which they can kind of use this area as kind of a test case for autonomous vehicle <coughs> infrastructure. So as if the RTA is successful, we may be able to attract some other funds for these um, innovative projects that they'd like to move forward with. But it's not something that we believe serves the long haul, line haul commuter very well because the infrastructure building that out would be kind of difficult to do. So like I didn't talk much about Uber or Lyft either, but we are looking at you know what's that last mile, first mile connection that would be made by Uber and Lyft and we would look at autonomous vehicles very similarly. Your BRT routes, you talked about dedicated lanes, dedicated vehicles. Would that be a new build for a lane or would you just take an existing car lane and, and run the buses on that? The way that it's planned now is that it's a new lane that comes from cutting into the median and shortening the lane widths of existing tra traffic lanes. Mm -hmm. So today you have, um, and this is my most recent example, forgive me for not being near, closer to you guys, Woodward and Ferndale at mm -hmm. Nine Mile. You've got four traffic lanes going north. And what we would do is those lanes, I believe right now, are 10 feet wide. You cut them by about two feet because you really only need seven feet for a traffic lane. So you get two, four, six, eight feet there. We're reading and the then, same, but sorry, we had, we're trying to solve another problem doing the same thing. Oh, okay, <laughs> so you get about eight feet there, right? And then you can cut about, yes, yeah, six and a half, something like that. And then you can cut another four feet out of the median, and then you have 12 feet or so to work with for a BRT lane okay. and a station. So that's basically the design that we have for BRT. And then finally, I do want to echo Trustee Lohmeyer's recommendation to, to please continue your study on the I-75 traffic during rush hour. Mm -hmm. David is absolutely correct. Traffic coming from the north down through Independence is bumper to bumper mm -hmm. at rush hour. And, and the volumes are there, in my opinion, to justify expanding your reach farther north. So with that, is that virtually the rush hour itself? We're not looking at something throughout the day. We're looking at the peak period hours. Two hours be. in the morning and two hours in the afternoon. Well, yeah, but though the afternoon tends to, yeah, I'm, I'm worried about the afternoon, when you leave, tends to be much more flexible, right? You can almost see, the, you can really see the surge come up out of 6.30, 7 o'clock up here. What, what's, um, I don't say frustrating because I think it's exciting about the opportunity is we're your atypical when you talk about long haul commuters we're the most northwestern part of the township right and such a huge number of folks are hitting the, the whether they're going down 75 or, or finding another path down and virtually if you're a motor <coughs> independence looking at this you're like that ah, doesn't hit me that's not going to do it for me I'm not going to ride to great great lakes isn't even in our township right even though it's right. it's, it's relatively we're not close. even on your maps so it doesn't it doesn't look our like township it isn't even on your maps did you know that I do know that <laughs> we try to we try to balance like what we put onto the maps because if we put everyone on there and it's no right. offense, I'm right. no, 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 so volume, no, but I'm volume just saying, yeah. you're gonna voters are going to look at it and say we're not even on the map. We're <coughs> more in Troy and Rochester, but uh, Clarkson Town, like, we're the one of the farthest unless you go to, and you still have commuters past us in Holly and Groveland, right, which also are not on the map. So I think from an important standpoint, if you're doing a two by two and saying, you know, what's what's the problem? How important is it to you? It's pretty important to us, and I think there's a willingness today that there wasn't in years past for people to, to do this type of thing. 
I'm tired of going to countries that are less developed than us, frankly, and have, they have better transportation uh, options for us. Um, but I, I, just a, a couple comments to throw on that. I think we can really maybe help clarify what the needs are up here, but also what we can do internally to support that. So if one of the solutions is we can provide this, you know, in phase 1.5, you know, Independence Township, it also might be what if we funded you some things to, to, to enable easier access to something in Independence. You mentioned the tie-in to um, disabled and handicapped. We do that today, right? We, we move our seniors around, we move folks that need to go to dialysis around. We're doing that today. If part of the solution could be helping us fund some of those vehicles, as well as getting people to the connection Absolutely. points, that's that's real, right? Some of the solutions might not be fix it for us, but give us the funds, because your own group, SEMCAG, is not very good about this either, <laughs> providing funds to us. Um, but that might be a way that we can help help skin the problem and we know our local community a little bit better. I was really glad you touched on first mile, last mile, because that was one thing in your presentation and everything I've seen is there's a lot of, when you get to this nexus point, you can get where you want to get. but that three miles to get over there there's not a huge parking lot at all of these um in other countries they'll marshal you know bikes so people can take them a couple miles but that's tough to have someone that lives maybe a half mile off woodward mm -hmm. in ferndale and everything goes as planned and there's still i i don't have a way to get there right or i'm i'm i'm, I'm juggling stuff around so that's important in the tie-in with ride sharing like uber and lyft mm -hmm. as well as car sharing like zipcar and a few others that way, I think you get a more complete picture. So I, I, I know you, you just started that dialogue, but I think they're kind of critical to you, and not just from a, that first mile, last mile, but in a, in a, a payment scheme as well, right? So yes. people want to get on, and I want to buy in, and I don't want to have eight different cards and juggle it around. I just want to be able to go from, from mode of transportation to mode to transportation. And you know, if it's Seems. one card or with a smartphone app, Uber's figured this out, right? Yes. It's very, very easy. You just step in the car. You never touch your wallet, and, yes. you, and you go. I think they could help in areas like ours, perhaps, too. And we have be. met with representatives from both Uber and Lyft and even Split, which is local to Michigan, and talked about what those potential um, technologies are that can connect us in and how you can do a voucher program. We don't, we're not solid enough on the, the specifics to talk about them yet, but we do believe that we'll get there pretty quickly. Um, if we do have success in November. That, that's looking, I guess, at the transit solution versus just a mass transit. Exactly. Because even, even the, there's some solution. overlap there where Uber's got into vans and things where mm -hmm. suddenly, like the Michi van Absolutely. type of scale, yes. that could maybe fill the gap on those those empty spots, so. Thank you so much, that's very helpful. Other questions from Tiffany? Just a comment from me, I guess the 85% the uh, return on investment, uh, you know, to me, it's, uh, that's another key to uh, promoting this for November anyways, is that I think a lot of people don't know that, you know, that that's one of the uh, caveats that's in the, in the program. So if you are putting money into it, you know, 85% of it gets spent back in your area. So. Can you clarify that? That's actually a good point. So that's 85% per county, not 85% of what Independence Township will pay into it comes back to Independence that Township is, that residents. Is, that is correct. It is the member jurisdiction. Um, right. But I think it's a big thing for Oakland County. I think Oakland County feels like they're the, the lost stepchild in the whole thing that, you know, they're going to be paying major money in and, and getting minority amount of the money back. So mm -hmm. it might not come to the northwest part of the county like we want it to, but at least it's right. coming back to Oakland County. And so. to that point, Mr. Ritchie, just so you know, uh, we work very closely with Bob Dada, who I have nothing but the utmost respect for. He is a financial genius. And he helped um, uh, helped us in the early stages of developing a financial policy because we can plan and say, here's what we believe we'll collect and here's what we believe we'll spend. But after that, he said, what happens when actual revenues come in and actual expenditures come in and how will you track that? because we want to be clear on that. So just last, uh, last month now, it's October already, uh, we adopted a financial policy that actually shows, and you can find it on our website in our last meeting packet, how we will track expenditures and revenues and how we will have um, accounts that basically are set up for overages if we have more funding come in and how, we are, how, how we'll work together on decision making for Oakland County to make sure that money goes back into Oakland County and doesn't just get absorbed into the RTA. Because one thing that I am very cautious about is that I don't want to be out of compliance with state law. I don't believe in prison. I don't want to go there. I don't think I do very well there. <laughs> so I want to meet the requirements of the law. And Bob has helped us get to that point in terms of the level of effort that the providers have to put in for us to be able to make this plan work, 
and also what happens with our actuals, not necessarily just the planning level information. So it must go back to the county. Tiffany, just a question. Is it 85% of the spending, the actual the actual expenditures have to be in that, or the value has to the be? The revenue. So 85% of the revenue that's collected well, that's, must be returned back. I have the utmost respect for Mr. Dadow to that. I don't know that that's, that's going to cause a lot of issues. Sometimes there could be a better decision for the overall system and for the, the recipient. And trying to balance that revenue piece out may cause you to make the wrong decision. So it let's see how it goes. But that's why you have the board. If the board votes on something, they might be they able can to override that. Yeah. Well, I'm just right. saying they and might be able to, be to certain, spend certain money if they all agree. And I think yeah. that's the whole purpose of, of having the uh, the one person veto type thing. It's, right. You know, to help control that. Mm -hmm. That doesn't preclude them, I think, to to agree to have an agreement on. On something okay. in general. Yeah, as long as they can they can steer the, the actual administration. It's just, that's a tough one. That's that a, is it is it's a, it's a difficult one, but the the way in which that um, both Bob and Jerry Quitson have seen this is an opportunity to give more to northern and western Oakland County communities if they do believe that they will beat our revenue um, forecasts right now. Uh, and that's because we have a four percent discount factor for, you know, uh, any type of heavy rollbacks or the uh, DRFT stuff or the road for the new tax uh, requirements and they don't believe that's going to have a, a, de a deleterious effect on what they collect which is about 99 percent of their taxes every year and so that additional funding that they believe will come in they're already talking about ways in which we can spend that that don't hurt the overall regional system there are needs in every single county that the RTA wasn't able to meet and so I don't think that um, at least in the first 10 to 15 years we're going to run into an issue where we're spending too much money in Oakland County and in not enough in any other place because Oakland County does have needs that we aren't able to meet today. Okay. Ms. Pilata? Um, since the money goes to the counties individually, it does affect the local um, municipalities. How much, and it disrupts them. So when a municipality is disrupted during the construction and all of that, how much um, input do they have in terms of making sure that it doesn't, that they have a part in the planning in terms of the actual construction and the disruption to their community. Oh, yes. So this is a very iterative process. So we're, what's, we're entering into what's called the Federal Transit Administration's New Starts and or Small Starts project process. And so we've already gone through the first phase on the BRT corridors where we have a representative, representative, we have a technical advisory committee and a policy advisory committee. The policy advisory committee are all the elected officials along that corridor for each municipality. And the technical committee is their, basically their appointees, their planning directors or their economic and community development directors. And they come together and we have a lot of committees at the RTA every month <laughs> and we talk about how to, how we develop what's called the locally preferred alternative that you saw today in those rapid transit projects. The next step in that is that we have to get into what's called NEPA, and that's your environmental assessment. You get this class of action for NEPA, and then you go through and you figure out what are all the effects on the plan from noise and vibration to environmental impacts, and then you have to do that assessment and make adaptations to the plan, and you, you, you have committees that walk you through that that are representative of the, the cities, villages, and townships. Then after you get through that phase, then you go into the engineering and the preliminary engineering and design phase. And then you have another committee of folks that come together and talk about this. And through each one of those iterative steps, you're doing public engagement. So every time we produce a document, we do a series of public meetings where we invite the public out to talk about that and get their feedback. And we do have to make adaptations based on what that feedback provides us. So when I say it's an iterative, very committee-focused process, that's how we are able to move forward with each line on the map that's proposed for rapid transit. Is there a possibility that if you run into problems, it would stall it or you would have to change the plan? Um, it, it's, a, it's always a possibility that something would have to change in the plan. And it, like I said, it's living and it's breathing. Mm -hmm. um, the plan that we have today, like I said, we didn't move forward until we had what we believed were the locally preferred alternatives that were adopted by these communities. And so that gives us some confidence that we're moving forward with this idea that these are the lines on the map that will move forward in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Last, last question, and I'll let you go. So we as a board I can't. So my, last, <laughs> my last question, then I'll let you go to her. I got a whole you might want to write this down. Yeah. Yeah. So as a, as a board, we can wait, make decisions and have a little bit of interaction tonight. So as a, as a takeaway here, you know, what I heard was we'd like to have some continued dialogue about how we how we actually get optimize the value up here in Independence. Mm -hmm. How do you want? So we got a, we got a vote coming up. We got a lot of things going on before uh, uh, things are locked in. How do you want to handle an ongoing dialogue with the with the township where we might be able to get some of these things 
we don't pay to slip service here to it, but we follow up and, and, and try to put some things in place that might help guide. How do you, how would you like to handle that with us here at Independence? Um, I, I tend to be because we are a staff of five right now. We're yeah. more of a with pool. With lots of committees. <laughs> yeah, with lots of committees. We're more of a pool organization and a push. So if you are able to give me a phone call or email me, Okay. Then I will come up to have a meeting with you guys. We can pull out maps and do sort of a small charrette with you all and talk about what the needs are, what the demographics look like, and how we could best serve that. Um, and I bring my chief planner with me, uh, Vince Duke, because he understands that stuff a lot better. So maybe I as I turn to the board, maybe we'll think about doing a little sub-team that could get mm -hmm. together for a few working sessions with sure. you to try and see what, what are the at least the top things that would build some value for us out of this. Excellent. I'm going. Sorry. I mean, my last question is done. You're Thank fine. So Okay, so how much are we, as I live here in Independence, how much am I currently paying for mass transit? You are in currently an opt-out community. We are. Yeah. So I don't have the numbers for you for the spe specialized transportation services that you provide today. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, but we are paying currently for mass transit. Not for no, mass transit. Not for mass transit. We usually no. specialize. You buy our own internal. Your own, whatever you yeah. provide. Yeah, we, we get our smart okay. buses with grants and then the labor. We, we what are the money. other What are the other taxes I'm paying that. currently that go towards the transit? Nothing else. No, no. no. I mean, none, none of the, the gas, gas tax. tax. The gas tax goes okay. to the comprehensive transportation fund, and we get right. a small portion of that. That to seaports, airports, roadways, and public transportation. Is the five point five cents a gallon an accurate number? Do you think? No. No. What do you think it is? Um, right now, I couldn't tell you exactly what it is, but we, like I said, the money comes in through the Michigan Transportation Fund. 10% mm -hmm. of what comes out of the gas tax goes to public transportation facilities. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the total number is, but that 10% that goes to public transportation facilities is used for airports, seaports, roads, and public transportation, and public transportation gets the smallest allocation of that fund. So the 5.5 cents per gallon, is it's, it's not true. I, I've seen some of the, mm -hmm. the I drive a electric car, so I'm going to help you. Right, <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a clause in there about raising registration fees. So we pay, so $10 of what we pay now mm -hmm. goes to public transportation. What would that be raised to? So, no, so, so I, I, I think I know uh, this kind of the, the origin of this. And the RTA has two options for a funding mechanism. We mm -hmm. can either go with the vehicle registration excise fee or we can go with the property tax millage. Either or has to be voter approved. Mm -hmm. We cannot simply just say voter registration fees are going up today for public mm -hmm. transportation. That is outside of our purview. We are not able to do that. So mm -hmm. nothing is coming out of your pocketbooks right now for vehicle registration fees from the RTA or I believe any other source right now. The property tax millage that we'd be asking for on November 8th would be the only source of funding locally coming to the RTA. Right, so, so a very small percent of the gas tax and not um, a huge increase. And is it, it's an either or, but not both. Correct. The property tax and the registration fee thing. Either or, and we only have, and if you look at I believe page six of that little newsletter that Marie handed out earlier, you can mm -hmm. see the language you can see that it's a 1.2 property tax millage. You can see what's raised and what you get out of that. And that is it. There's no smoke and mirrors. There's no surprises. No aha, no gotchas. We can't do that at the RTA. We're too brand new <laughs> to be able to surprise people with extra, extra costs. Yes. OK, so like a lot of the main purpose of this, and I paid a lot of attention to it when it was all first starting up and earlier in the spring and over the summer, mm -hmm. was to get people to their jobs and to improve independent living, seniors, disabled, yes. or whatever. Based on the plan as it currently is, how how is that improved in Independence Township? It's it's one of the things that we look at collectively, and I haven't done it counts community by community. Um, mm -hmm. we, we simply just don't have the bandwidth right now. But what we can say is that it does increase job access by 60%, and it increases service hours by 55%. And so that's a large increase for the region, some total. And I don't have individual communities outlined for I that. guess my point is, we don't, the buses aren't going to come here, the trains aren't going to come here, everybody's going to have a way here. I don't, I don't see, there is no WIFM in Independence Township um, until or unless further down the line the culture of transportation changes here and people start driving to Pontiac to get on the train and going somewhere mm -hmm. like that. So as it stands right now, in the plan that in a month we would be voting for. Is there a guarantee that we'll get additional services here? 
The flexible transit program is designed specifically for the communities that don't have a fixed route mm -hmm. transit line. So we will map. absolutely get funding for that here in Independence. It's something that you have to make a application so to the RTA to to be able to get it done. So it's no. Nothing like that. I can't guarantee that today because it's not a line on the map, but I can tell you that I am in constant communication with Oakland County about mm -hmm. the equitable distribution of funding in Oakland County. I'm sure. Um, I can imagine you have a very difficult job. It's fun. Um, <laughs> So, and then let's talk about the fees. Like if we have the, um, the transportation, I'm looking at your thing, like the demand response transportation being an opportunity for our seniors and um, disabled. disabled. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of fees were you looking at for charging for those services? That's all, it's all kind of to be Ballpark. determined. It's all part of to be determined. What we can say today, we did a 20% fare box recovery in the financial model that we built. And in some areas, we're able to do a dollar fifty, two dollars for a ride. Typically, what you see today on the public transit options that are available, we'd be mm -hmm. consistent with that. And the reason for that is that any fare boxes that you determine can't negatively, disproportionately impact any population. And so we can't just say, well, today you're going to pay fifteen dollars for this fare, and right. now everybody has to pay that. You have to stay sort of within a, a, a particular range that right. people can afford. But you've done like four different fiscal analysis revisions, and you've got. Um, revenue in there so if this is part of it there had to be some kind of a number that you were right. looking at 20% fare box recovery and that's the sum total of all of the lines that we have in the map right. so we took 20% and said that would cover the, co the cost of this 20% of the cost of the services that are pro being provided and with that we didn't do fare policy because when you get to fare policy that's a lot of that's a big undertaking with the federal government who puts mm -hmm. there who inserts themselves into that decision-making process to make sure that environmental justice is being served and that you're not creating fares that are inaccessible to a particular population and right so, so when we're talking about specifically the demand response transportation which sounds like the kind of thing that would be happening here mm -hmm. if fingers crossed we get to get that mm -hmm. um, you know we, we can vote on hope um, you're saying that it would be like somewhere in the dollar fifty range for wheelchair access transportation it could be a dollar fifty it could be three dollars I don't want to make a promise to you right. about fare box and not having done the I get fare it. Box you, study at this point I it's really not set but that. I was hoping that you would have some kind of an estimate because yeah. right now they're having to pay twenty five dollars mm -hmm. a fare plus two dollars a mile I've got mm -hmm. a couple of their things here the services that they're using oh, now yeah. so you don't think it's going to be anywhere near that kind I of really thing I really don't I mean honestly if you're looking at those type of fares and you come into the RTA and say right now our seniors are paying far too much to get the transportation that's provided can you help us with the voucher system or something of that sort this will be a creative and innovative program that's something that the RTA would gladly participate in to try to make sure that the individual communities that do not have a fixed route line on the map are getting benefit from the RTA so yes so and, and this will be my last question. Mm -hmm. um, so what would you say to the people in Independence Township? Mm -hmm. What's in it for them the way it stands now, mm -hmm. other than hope and fingers crossed on maybe getting stuff later when we apply for things? Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of immediate access improvement for them without having to drive to another community to get on the transportation? You know, honestly, when I, the, the answer to that is um, probably not the answer that you want to hear. And it is a derivative benefit of the region doing better and being more successful and attracting more jobs and more opportunity to the region mm -hmm. and attracting people and retaining talent. Because right now what we have is U of M and Michigan State producing very talented and capable individuals and sending them to the rest of the nation to do their job. <laughs> And we want to start to keep them here. And what we're seeing from Ford and GM and from Chrysler is that they want these public transportation options because they want to be able to stay here and they want to be able to attract that talent. And a lot of those people that are leaving Independence Township every day to go to work somewhere else are people who see and, li and work in those areas that want to attract those live, work, play environments. And without those live, work, play environments that come from public transportation, this region stands to fall behind going forward as a as a whole collectively mm -hmm. and so today there's no lines on the map that serve Independence Township I'm not one to blow smoke I never will mm -hmm. I will tell you the truth there's not a line on the map I can't make you guarantees I don't think that you'd be voting on hope I think you'd be voting and betting on the region if you support the RTA plan um, and if you look at it and understand how the flexible transit options do work and that we are in constant conversations and Oakland County is 
not relenting in any way, shape, or form, and they're mm -hmm. fighting on your behalf on a very regular basis. I could show you my inbox is hoping now the emails from Bob Dadow are impressive. <laughs> um, <laughs> I will tell you there is something in it for everyone. Today I can't articulate exactly what that is for you, but I do believe that they're not going to stop fighting until they do see something in it for everyone. Any other questions for Ms. Bender? No, I think that's a tall order in four weeks. Yeah. And Can't just, and just to kind of put things into perspective, $1.2 million equates to about $1.7 million in tax revenue per year that would go towards ERTA over 20 years, not being a math wizard, assuming no growth, no inflation, mm -hmm. is $34 million. Right. Mm -hmm. So hence our concern, ma'am, about providing yes. some level of service. We, we understand <laughs> the greater good, Absolutely. but I also understand $37 million. Yes, sir. Right. The $34 yes. million. I'm sorry. I to interrupt. I, we all understand the regional thing, totally support the idea of rapid transit, things need to be done and everything, but you're asking us to pay for something. Um, and people need to know where you're with them, what's in it for me. I did want to clarify the one question though. Um, you know, we offer, we offer transportation services to our seniors here in our township that we pay for. Would possibly, just is it, is it allowable that we would get RTA funding for that service. Absolutely. It's yeah. flexible that transit. The, that was the potential for That's me. That's the flexible transit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you understand we go to our voters regularly for our own villages, so yes. we're incredibly sensitive mm -hmm. to yes. our own SR. But that could be an option where we control a little more of our own destiny and, and building that up mm -hmm. a little bit. If we were to get funding for vehicles and funding for operations, yes. which we chin today. Mm -hmm. That could There's be a potential else, solution though. to tie into the system. So right. It's just as long as it's allowable under the structure. Yeah. Absolutely allowable. And I think you said yeah. voter registration fees earlier, but you meant vehicle registration. Vehicle, vehicle registration. Three minutes as we play this live. They're going to charge me to vote? <laughs> <laughs> no. Of course not yet. Perfect. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank, Thank you so you. much. I appreciate Thank you coming you. out. You're very, very good. Thank, Thank you so much. <laughs> going to log myself out of my email. I told you you could look at it, but I didn't. Oh, don't worry. We won't look at nothing from Bob. Uh, it is 10 after 8. Why don't we take a five-minute break? Okay.